right, so today's um, session will be maybe somewhat of a continuation of like a couple of sessions in the past with KJ regarding um, some machine learning stuff with scikit-learn in Python. Um, if, in particular, I was going to go more into depth about like decision trees in general for, uh, in particular for classification. Um, <clears throat> so I know it's not like R, <laughs> it's Python, but um, this has been like useful for me to learn um, in terms of genomics. Like, um, I found like applications here for decision trees, and I think it's like a straightforward and good way to start into um, like supervised learning and machine learning. Um, so uh, if you want, you can follow along with this Jupyter notebook, but like I'll be doing everything interactively and showing the results, so it's not totally necessary, but. Um, anyways, like before I jump in quickly, um, I like don't know how to embed images in <laughs> super notebooks. Uh, first thing is like, like there's this like just to introduce the concept of decision trees. It's like you have some sort of data set. In this case, let's say we have like information about like basically a table of data with people's heights and people's weights, and you want to like predict if they're male or female. So like, a super simple example just to show what decision trees are. Um, so like one natural way to sort of um, split the data is to start from the top and say like, okay, let's just see what people's heights are. Um, and if they're taller in a certain threshold, we might call them male. Um, if not, then we'll go and actually check what their weight is and depending on that, um, predict if they're male or female. So very basic prediction algorithm, but the idea here is that like, you have a set of features in your data that you will be used to predict like classes in this case like male and female um and decision trees like find ways to split the data such that like um classes are like effectively categorized um correctly um so as for the, the code side of things um so we're going to be importing some libraries as you normally do. Um, mostly we'll be using like scikit-learn related stuff, um, a big machine learning library in Python, um, and some tools for visualization. So let's go ahead and run this. I'm not even connected yet, but it should still go pretty quick. Um, and just for today's like demonstration, we'll be like using the Iris data set. So like um, that's available from like it's a really common data set, so it's available from a lot of locations. But in this case, we're using the Seaborn package to just load it because it has it built in. Um, so let's load that and then take a look. I guess I already have the outputs. Um, but um, basically, yeah, it's like a table with a lot of details about like different flowers, I think. <laughs> um, and we have like different lengths and widths for different characteristics of the flower. Um, and so for the purposes of today, we'll be basically looking at um, how we can use those features to predict what species the flower is. Um, so, um, so yeah, we have the data set as, as a whole, but um, so our first step will be to like divide it into like our inputs to whatever model we're gonna be using. In this case, it's a decision tree. Um, so we're gonna be splitting it into inputs and outputs. Um, okay, so we go down and everything, for our inputs, really, we want, we think probably all of these features will be potentially useful for predicting species. So we're going to take all of them. Um, so we're going to define our inputs as everything except the species column. So we're just going to drop, basically take errors, drop the species column, uh, and then take a look to make sure we did that right. Um, so yeah, this is exactly the same table, just without the column, which is how we want our data formatted. Um, and then, like naturally, of course, then the labels for our data will just be this only the species column. Um, so, yeah, we can print the head of it, which is just only shows one species. So, like another thing you can do just to make sure you, we understand what the problem is, um, is print, print the unique values. So, just to see like that we do have like multiple classes of um, or multiple species of flower. Um, so that looks good as expected. Uh, and then a natural like next step when doing a lot of like machine learning tasks is you want to split your data set 
um, into uh, training and test groups. So like you want some sort of data to train a model on, um, and then you want an independent data set that you can actually test the performance on that isn't biased by the way that the model was trained. And that's, that's to evaluate like um, if there's any sort of meaningful generalization in your model that you can actually apply to data as it's seen. Um, so with second learn, it's super straightforward. Um, you just use like the train test split function. Um, it's just on a test size of 0.2, so 20%. Um, and then another important important parameter here that I typically use is the stratify argument. So with that, we're saying let's take the classes from our, our labels, so each of the species, and we want to uh, make sure that the training and test sets are roughly equal in terms of what proportions of each species um, they have. And so that, that's important because, um, for example, in the most extreme ridiculous case, you could have only one species in the uh, training <laughs> training data and then a completely different one in the test data. And like, clearly your model's not gonna know what to do if that's the case. And in general, if there's any sort of imbalance, like you're gonna get some sort of bias in the way the model's trained and it's not gonna generalize as well. So that's just a really convenient way to make sure things are balanced across the classes. Um, um, so before we dive into the decision tree part, like. Um, I found it, I think it's useful to like to find a couple of functions here. So we're going to be basically, once we have a model, um, we're going to be taking um, the training and test data and we're going to be using the model.score function to uh, just compute accuracy on uh, the training data and then on the test data and just print it. So super simple function, but um, be useful since we'll be probably running as few different times. Um, and I do want to mention that like uh, model.score is like there's a lot of other ways to score your um, how well a model is performing. So like accuracy is a really simple metric, but just want to point out that there's like a lot more metrics than just accuracy. Um, and accuracy is not always the best one, but for this case, it's like I think does well enough. Um, and then um, we'll get more into this later in the um, in this notebook, but like uh, the next function here basically just helps to visualize the decision tree once we have it. And again, I'll just like it'll be more helpful when we actually can show it right like visually. But um, basically, we're just going to be returning an object that we can print to the screen and it shows what a decision tree looks like. Um, so yeah, let's um, run that. And now we can actually jump in. So like how we train a decision tree and what it actually looks like for this data set in particular. Um, so I think a natural thing to try generally when you're starting out and you're trying a model for your data, it's just like, okay, let's see if it works well with default parameters. So, um, I mean, the only thing I'm doing here is I'm making it deterministic. Um, some, some models have some sort of randomness and like just I'm setting the seed, but other than that, we're using default settings. Um, so generally, you, it's scikit-learn, it's like very, straightforward you can train many different types of models in basically two lines here we're just instantiating the model itself and then we're fitting it to the training data uh, using the inputs and then the output labels um, and then i'm calling that function above to print the accuracy and as you see i i should have cleared this or let's see what i did wrong did i i think i skipped a cell yeah never actually uh oops forgot to run that one um, but yeah, I quote, sort of spoiled the uh, results here. Actually, we do very well with default settings. Um, like 97-ish percent is pretty great in the test set. Um, so, I mean, we, we do see maybe it's potentially concerning that like we're getting exactly 100% on the um, training, training data. And you'll find that with like decision trees, like that's, if you just use default settings off and you'll fit a perfect tree for your training data, which in a lot of cases is asking to like overfit. So to, to make a model that doesn't really generalize very well, but in this case, we do do well in the test set. But um, anyways, like next step, we can actually just visualize what this tree looks like. Um, call that visualize tree function. Um, and we get something that's like 
pretty complex. Um, let me zoom out a bit. So again, so how these work is um, we're starting from the top and um, the tree is basically automatically picking, selecting features from our, our data that it um, can most efficiently split the data by. So like in, at the top, it turns out that petal width is one of the biggest factors that splits our data into two um, different species, flower species. So right away, like if the petal width is less than 0.8, we just call it a setosa. Um, and if it's greater than that, then we go on to look at other features. Uh, and note that there are like with default settings, you might have a feature a feature that gets reused multiple times. So like we just check pedal width here, but then we actually check it again here. Um, and then farther down in the tree in multiple places. So um, um, yeah, and so we keep going down use other features as it helps to split the data and it automatically finds the best splitting point at each going in a sort of going in the downward direction. Um, you might find uh, one thing to note is that like as a human, you might once we make it once we make this tree, uh, we might look at it afterward and say like, hey, why is this, this is actually more complicated than it needed to be. Like we could have simple like looking at the big picture, sometimes you can visually find ways to simplify the tree. So I guess it's worth noting that it's not necessarily going to find um, the most simple tree. Um, uh, that's one problem, but um, I guess something probably more potentially concerning, although again, we do well in the test data, but in a lot of cases, you'll have a situation like this where you have, if you look at the leaves, where we finally define, after checking all these features, we finally define what species things belong to. Um, Something potentially concerning is that we have actually only like one or two samples in each of these um, leaf nodes, which is like often a sign of like overfitting because like we're finding a very particular way to place our training data, and um, that that can sometimes be like a predict predictor of like a model that doesn't generalize well. Again, like our case, it seems to do fine, but I just want to like. Like a heads up. Nick? Yeah. You're, you're reading that a little bit wrong. Um, yeah, if because if you see Veronica 0035, most of them are being classified, and there's only a few left. So uh -huh. so you can see that they're getting quite good at classification here at just at this top level, what you were saying, that's probably where you would end it for a more generalized approach, right? And the last two trees, length of trees are where it's probably overfitting. But in general, that this like this, the I don't know if it's maybe just the way you're saying it, but the, it is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's still classifying three samples left. And this is how it's deciding to classify those. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. 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 I'm not, sorry. I'm, not, I'm not sure I totally followed. Um, I mean, I understand that. Yeah, this is definitely what the decision trees expected to do when you train it. Um, but I guess when you allow it to, what I was trying to say is like when you allow it to, um, I mean, we'll, we'll be later in this notebook, we'll be doing things like controlling the um, depth and stuff like that. Um, but I guess I was trying to say that like if you allow it to keep, trying to fit every single example, even to like its own category, that's like a sign that you might be overfitting. If that's, um, is that like, that's correct, right? <laughs> Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, but like you don't have to see the tree to know you're probably overfitting because you only have four um, um, features, like four, so you're gonna overfit. Um, yeah, 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 that's true. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's also a function of like how many features you have and how much data and stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, fair enough. Uh, so yeah, and then that also naturally brings into like the fact that we have such a deep tree is also something that we might be concerned about. And also just from an interpret interpretability perspective, like if this is the model you find for your data, like 
and you want to share this and explain this to someone, somebody, it's like unnecessarily complicated. So even if it performs well, we might want to um, maybe keep things simple where possible. So that's sort of the next step that I um, go into here. So like, yeah, it's, things are probably more complicated than we needed them to be and hard to visually interpret. Um, so there's a number of like hyperparameters we can dive into to control this. Um, so like the, we can start with um, this parameter called um, CCP alpha. Um, so this is sort of a direct way to um, penalize the complexity of the tree. And in particular, it's punishing the tree for the number of um, leaves it has. So it, it's trying to both optimize the tree in terms of splitting the data accurately into classes, um, as well as um, trying to minimize the number of leaves that the um, tree has. So this is one natural way to like, um, this is also like called like regularization. So it's like a restriction that you place in the optimization task to um, usually to prevent overfitting on the training data. Um, but also it has this effect of like improving interpretability, I guess, which is sort of what we were going for. Um, so we just, I did actually like, I guess I should just for full, like to be fully transparent, I did test a few values here. So like, you're not gonna necessarily know what the right value is right away, but like, Taking a value of 0 0.05 um, gives like this um, much simpler tree with similar accuracy. So it looks like the accuracy went down. But one thing I do want to mention is that actually our data set is so small that um, I did the math and basically like this is a difference of um, one training example. <laughs> so between originally we got 96.7% uh, and here we get. 93.3%, but our data set's so small that it's actually only one example different. And so it's not necessarily like even a meaningful change here. So we might actually be doing just as well, but our data set's too small to really know the difference. Um, but in any case, we have a much simpler model where we actually, we're not even using all the features actually, we're only using pedal width. Actually, we're only using one feature here. So, um, Usually, that's probably a sign that this is too simple of a model. Like we're, we're performing well, but often, like I would imagine that pedal length and stuff also are useful for deciding a species. That might not necessarily be true, but um, yeah, just things to look at. Like maybe in other problems, maybe it might be important to make sure all your features are being used if you're confident that they should be um, predictive of the the class. Um, yeah. So uh, that's one way to do it. Another way is like there's some other parameters. So you could actually, um, I think sort of what KJ was touching on before was like this, um, you can also cut off the depth basically to make sure that we don't keep splitting our data. And so we can specify the parameter max depth. Um, so that's another way to restrict the complexity of the tree. You can also make sure that the leaves, the thing I was mentioning earlier is like, um, by default, you could have a leaf with exactly one sample, and we could make it um, require that they have a lot more samples um, by raising this value of min samples leaf. Um, so both of those also could be seen as a form of regularization and can help overfit when, um, or prevent overfitting, I mean, um, when it's present. Um, so yeah, we can run this. And yeah, we actually get um, pretty much an identical, or not identical, but it's, uh, oh wait, it is identical. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So in this case, we do get an identical tree by modifying different variables. But um, I guess that's just like to sort of introduce some of the common things you might treat, uh, parameters you might treat with this, these decision tree models in second learn. Um, um, so this, um, does pretty well. We were manually picking hyperparameters, but I, like another alternative here is since we have a really small data set and we're also using like a model that's really fast to train, um, we might as well take advantage of some automation by doing something called a grid search. Um, so basically like, um, actually, 
before going into what a grid search is, I should mention that like, um, if we were to, so I guess in this tutorial, I basically, I showed you one value of um, the hyperparameter, but you might be tempted if you were actually trying to figure this out. Um, in practice, you might be manually picking different values and trying a bunch of different values and then looking at the performance on the test data um, and not, it's a bit risky actually. So in that process, if you manually, if you're playing around the, with parameters and you're always checking it against the um, test data, you risk sort of leaking information about the test data into the training process. You're ultimately, you're really sort of like optimizing your model for the test data. And then at that point, the test data is not functioning as, as test data. So you're, you'll inflate your test scores and you'll get sort of inaccurate results. Um, so um, we're going to be doing like a grid search and we'll um, also be addressing that problem of possibly leaking test information or information about the test data. Um, but grid search is basically just test every possible combination of hyperparameters that you supply in a basically like a discrete range. Um, so like I'll be taking advantage of some like NumPy functions. So um, basically there's like this, if you, um, for the minimum, like the minimum number of samples in the leaves, I, I wanted to try like um, basically like every 10 values up to 50 starting with, the, with one. It turns out it actually like complains and you give it a value of zero, which I mean, obviously a value of zero is like not, doesn't mean anything, but anyways. Um, so this lin space function sort of linearly spaces values in a, in a range you give it. Um, so that's useful for the min samples leaf argument. Um, so we could also, since we're playing around with the CCP alpha parameter, um, we can test a range of that. And often when you're dealing with parameters that have to do with like a penalty term or um, sort of like a regularization term, the more natural um, way to, to test out um, parameters in that range is on a logarithmic scale, um, because you're sort of testing, testing like the magnitude, the order of magnitude where the parameter is having an effect rather than like the absolute value of it. Um, so typically you'll want to use like something like Logs like this log space function to make sure things are spaced um, logarithmic, logarithmically. Um, so yeah, basically we just get like we're just um, in both cases these functions will just output an array. Um, and in this case, I wanted to add the value of zero just to test if no regularization was better than any regularization. So I made this into a list and um, concatenated it to the numpy array, um, but. I think um, any like iterable is okay for what we'll be doing. Um, okay, so now we want to actually make this grid of hyperparameters to search through. Um, so we were playing around with three parameters, and let's just try those three parameters um, in this grid. So uh, max depth, we'll see, we'll go from uh, depth of two to up to five. And then, as I mentioned before, we'll be testing the other parameters using those functions from above. Um, and so basically we have like, this is a lot of values, um, but since the models, the training data is small and the models are simple to train, um, we can do this relatively fast. And so that's why it's sort of appropriate here. Um, so let's make this dictionary of parameters. Uh, and we'll be using this grid search CV function. Um, so it's performing a grid search, but also importantly, we're only accessing the training data in order to validate the performance of the model. Um, and um, uh, it's using what's called like cross validation. So we're basically chunking up the, tr the training data into chunks and then we're, the, actually I have a good, there's a good visual for this um, from scikit-learn actually. So this is essentially what we'll be doing. We have like a, 80% of our training data. Um, we're using all of that and we're doing splitting into five folds. So like um, basically in the first split, we have, um, 
we're going to be training the model on folds two through five, and then we're going to be testing its performance on fold one. Um, so that's sort of a way to like use your training data um, in a way to like fairly test um, the performance without actually looking at your test data yet. Um, and basically, we repeat over different folds. Um, so we're testing on different chunks each time, and then we're basically usually taking like the average of the performance to get a, a final like assessment of how the model is doing. Um, and then, yeah, at the end, once we actually find like good parameters, then we look at the test data to get an objective measure of like how well we're doing, but not before that because we don't want to leak information. Um, yeah. so, just, just before you go on, uh, th that has a name, and it's called the validation set slash developmental set. So that little test set within the training set, mm -hmm. okay, you can make those yourself um, for when you want to do with that train split. You just take the training, and then you split it again. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if somebody asks you, say you're using this for like looking at bipolar or MDD or something, and they want to know, okay, how did you make sure you didn't have any leakage when you were hyper tuning? You say, well, I have a validation set. That's that's the word you want to write in your methods and like when you're writing it up or describing it to other people. Okay. Yeah. So you mean for like not not calling it test data, but calling it validation? Or are you saying, is that what you meant? It's not, yeah, because the test set is that final set um, oh. that is not in the training. You don't touch it at all. And then the validation set is a, like you get three types of data sets. Yeah. And so uh, in the training, you split that again. And that is what it's doing for the cross, uh, the grid search cross validation. And it, it's doing exactly as you explained. It just highlighted it as it called it test set twice, but that could be quite confusing. And like, if you're talking like in any kind of formal setting or even like somewhat informal when you're teaching like students or something, remember to say validation set or developmental set, because that's what it's used for. This is that set that's going to tell you whether or not uh, that, that you're using to refine your your model so for the hyper tuning um so you're saying the validation set is the like the blue yeah these folds yes the blue folds those are your validation sets okay. in, in this cross validation model and it's it's i guess it's easier to visualize when you're doing it yourself but the yellow or this orange that is your test set your your real test set while the blue is is that as your validation set? Okay, um, cool. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I actually thought it was reverse, so that, that's good to clear that up. Um, yeah, that's so, good. And that's test. All right, thanks. Um, yeah. So, um, um, yeah. So basically, we're doing this that chunking method cross validation, um, and then. Um, Basically, uh, we give it like the decision tree model. Um, and then in this case, like the only parameter that we want to keep the same every time is the just setting the random seed. And then we give it this the dictionary of um, parameters that we want to tune um, that we just defined up here. And we're going to be using five folds um, for the validation. And then um, you can also give it like a metric. And like, for this, we'll just use like that. The accuracy again there's a lot of other metrics that like this should be fine for now um and then once you call like dot fit um the dot fit method on the, the training data then it will basically find the result it takes like in this case it takes like five seconds um or so but um it finds the best hyperparameters um so if we print those um then we get like actually no regularization seem to do well within this best within this grid of parameters. Um, a really small depth was did well and actually keeping um, the min samples leak as low as possible actually was did best. I think we tried. Um, 
So yeah, once we find that, then we, we can directly access like the version of the model uh, with the best performing hyperparameters. It's like this grid.best estimator um, objects. Um, and then again, since we were, we were testing its performance against like the validation sets, um, but to verify the final performance, we can use this held out test data. Um, so let's do that, print the accuracy, and then print what the tree looks like. Um, it looks like we got the same performance as what we did manually. And um, actually, I think this data set is like small enough and like few enough features that we're actually getting the exact same model, <laughs> turns out. Um, but this- it, you, you use the random state, so everything should be the same. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you turn a random state uh, to like 13 or something, things will change. But since you have the random state in there, uh, you will get the exact same thing. Mm. Oh, right. Yeah, true. It is deterministic. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we achieved the same thing um, using the like automated process. Um, and uh, um, yeah. Before you go on. I'm, I'm quite curious uh, what your training model will do if you use a a, 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 um, a multi-classifier metric. Could you just put, instead of accuracy in your training model in that 15, rock underscore uh, AUC underscore score? I put it in the chat if you... Um... I'm just curious if it does better or not. Since it's such a, it's that iris data set is really easy to predict, but. So in the good search part or? Um, yeah, in the scoring. Yeah, if you change your scoring to, yeah. Um, oops. Uh, yeah, let's see what happens. Um, um, not explore. Um, okay, let's see what this is. Um, uh, oh, uh, get rid of the score part. Okay. Um, it that either. Multi class format is not supported. Um, did I end up with any? Uh, all right. Okay. I don't know. I haven't actually played around with what metrics. Yeah, so I don't know off the top of my head. Um, oh, okay. So it doesn't it doesn't support. I thought decision tree automatically supported. Uh, multi class formats. Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not sure what you mean, like. Because this is multiple, it's not like binary, but this is multiple. Yeah, yeah. So like not all of the the classifications will work out of the box if for like three multi-class versus binary. Right. And you'll work fine with the decision tree classifier. Normally those are good with like multiple. You don't have to do anything else. Yep. Like, uh, uh, and the rock uh score the area under the, the receiving curve score thing that is specific for multi-classification mm -hmm. so especially uneven it's very important for when we do like neuropsychiatric if we want to put more than two you've got to use the rock so i was wondering if it would do better or worse but i i, I have to to admit i don't normally do much hyper tuning uh so with grid search so it might be that the grid search itself does not like um, multi-class scorers. I feel like it might support that. I thought I would remember that in the documentation, but I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't, don't actually know what to do it off the top of my head, and it might require some other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's true that it's important because we could be getting like really good performance on one class and not the others, for example. Yeah, um, which you want to pick up on with accuracy. Um, 
yeah, and that's definitely like in this data set, or uh, there's definitely data sets where it's like it's incredibly important for that to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but um, yeah, oh, yeah. it's probably not a deal. All right. yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I am curious, but yeah, we can figure that out. Uh, yeah, thank you for humoring me. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, okay, so we did decision trees and like, there's a lot more to go into. Actually, first, before we even get into the logistic regression, like, um, I guess it's worth noting that there's a lot more you could do with just decision tree based models. So like, this is just a single decision tree, but there's what's called like ensemble techniques where you can do things like use a bunch of different decision trees that look at different features and are sort of um, so like a random forest, for example, will take a bunch of decision trees that um, are supposed to be uncorrelated and um, get like a stronger and more robust model. Uh, maybe it's slightly harder to interpret, but um, definitely like performs better. Uh, and there's also things like boosted trees or a bunch of techniques where you basically use like a multiple trees to get a more robust model. So there's a lot more you can do with this. This is just sort of touching the surface of um, the most basic form of this model, but even basic forms work very well for a lot of problems. So um, it's a good starting point. Um, and then we can also explore other things like logistic regression. Um, and it's sort of, I mean, we're sort of, uh, nowhere in this code would you see that we're actually sort of doing something sneaky, which is like that logistic regression is sort of like classically defined for binary classification problems where you have like, um, you're trying to determine if something belongs to a class versus doesn't, uh, for example. And um, there's different ways to like basically make um, a binary classification problem into a multi-class one that you don't actually see show up in the code. It just does it by default or has like sensible defaults that you wouldn't even know about them if you didn't um, read into it, I guess. But um, in any case, my point here really is that like, with scikit-learn, like you can really very quickly test other models in like just a couple lines of code. And like, um, actually in this case, we're doing very well with default settings logistic for logistic regression. Um, and then, yeah, oh, we could, I don't wanna like um, dive into something and then not really explain it, but like, <laughs> so I guess I'll briefly explain that like some models, uh, require some normalization of the inputs. So like if we go to the top, um, uh, we have like lengths and widths that are like, uh, I don't know, like one to five, which is not bad, but like a lot of models will expect that your data has like a mean of zero and the variance of one, or often that will improve like um, how the model works. So, uh, and for logistic regression, it's particularly true. Uh, I mean, it's more like of a deep, big deal if you have like drastic differences between the magnitudes of the columns, which we don't see here, but like usually you want to normalize and like that's also very simple with scikit-learn. You can actually do like use this function called make pipeline um, and uh, you can sort of chain together different steps. So you have like your normalization of the data and then the logistic regression model itself. And then um, you can fit that to the training data. And then when you run the model anywhere else, it'll basically like divide by, or subtract the mean and divide by the uh, variance um, of the training data. So like you can, and it'll do that automatically and apply the model. But I guess my point here is that like, not to dive too deep into it, but to show that like this framework of like, just instantiate a model dot call dot fit it's like so simple that you can apply like even sophisticated models without even knowing what you're doing necessarily uh it's just really straightforward and um makes things easy uh, obviously it's good to learn about how they work but um yeah um yeah i mean that's all i have today but um i want to just put like a side note to put in like comparison Standard scaling is pretty much the exact same thing we do when we do like differential expression analysis for reads. Okay. okay. It's the same kind of principle where you might get some features that have like super high expression and then other ones. So you, it's the same idea where you're normalizing across so you don't get 
a, a misleading indicator. But uh -huh. also, a lot of the models are um, uniform. They expect uniform. Yeah. Um, true. Yeah. As you were talking about. But if people wanted to think about it, like so in a way we already kind of understand, it's like it's similar to that. And so sure, yeah. Good point. Um, yeah. Hey Nick. Uh -huh. I've never used the make pipeline uh from Cycle Learn. I kind of I know that you don't want to like dwell in like go into it more in detail, but what is like what are the inputs that it needs? What is this function exactly doing? Is it's like just creating an input pipeline for the function so you can fit it on the data? Um yeah, you can you can put any sort of um I mean we can look at the uh let's see. Um it might explain it better than I would. Um so um, yeah, you have like different. Basically, you can let me open this up in a new tab. Uh, um, so you can provide it an arbitrary number of steps mm -hmm. here. So whether that be like a model or um, just a function that scales the data. Um, but yeah, you can do as many as you want, and then it just will. Um, when you call like the dot fit function, then it's uh, it's basically going through and um, I think it's calling like it's technically calling a dot fit of each of its elements so like when you do dot fit of standard scalar it's mm -hmm. finding the mean and variance to, to scale data by um, that will then apply to like test data if you call it later um, you can give it multiple uh, like standard scalar like oh, the example that they've given and uh, it would call fit on each of those. Yeah, exactly. Um, which means something different, maybe for scaling versus logistic regression, but it's um, still, I think it does what you would expect it to do, maybe like in terms of, um, but yeah, you can change as many as things as you want together. Um, yeah. It's nice for readable for code. So, theory, what it does is that scalar, you would fit it just like you would fit a number model. So it says that when he's, I don't know if I can do that annotate. See this here? You would normally do that for everything you call. You have to fit it. And then uh, oftentimes you don't just fit, you also fit transform. So this is automatically fitting and then transforming the X value for you. So you don't have to, to do it because normally you could write the same thing scale where uh this is this is horrible but <laughs> and then you have that the function here yeah and then you fit it and then you fit that to the x really and then you and sometimes y i think depending on what you're fitting right. but this is normal x and then before you can actually use that you would normally then fit transform or you can use the fit transform this is an absolutely ridiculous, but yeah. So when you put it in the pipeline, um, when you put it in the pipeline, you no longer, you, you it does it automatically because it's like, oh, I know what you want to do. It's, it's like, a, you want to use this, so you're going to fit, transform it, and then you're going to put it in your model. And so uh -huh. instead of having to write uh, two extra lines, if you want to be readable, or you could do a chain, in one line you you don't have to you just put it in this little like list and then it goes and works mm -hmm. this is why i love python they just create like tiny little functions helper functions for every single thing that you need to do this is very nice thought too yeah. the pipeline because pytorch is very similar mm -hmm. in that you have to def you define layers and stuff in a kind of similar chain way and they have these kind of pipelines in that too. So if you get very familiar with making pipelines and uh, sidekick learn, then yeah. moving on to like a neural network, you will be like, oh, okay, I kind of understand what's going on. And the first thing is going to apply that. And then I'm going to apply this. Yeah. So, yes. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, KJ. So hopefully that was informative and helpful.